This is trigonometry, section 4.6, and we're going to be graphing other trigonometric functions. And by other, we mean other than sine and cosine. Although sine and cosine are the most important ones, today we're going to be graphing tangent, cotangent, secant, cosecant, and at the very end I'll just introduce you to a damped trigonometric function. Uh, buckle up. Uh, these look a little bit different. On the homework, I only am asking you to graph four of them, and I definitely encourage you to use Desmos as a real guide as you graph these. So what are some things that we know or hopefully we've been briefly introduced to before? The first is that the tangent function is odd. Therefore, its symmetry is around the origin. We also know that tangent is sine divided by cosine. So we often have undefined values whenever cosine is equal to zero. So if you look at your unit circle, where are some values where cosine is equal to zero? At places like pi over two, three pi over two, if we kept going back around the circle, five pi over two, seven pi over two. Notice to go from one to the other in terms of where it's undefined, all I'm doing is I'm adding pi, but I'm kind of adding pi on the up and down the y-axis so we wind up with these fractional answers. So let's look at like a table of points here because what happens when it approaches those undefined values? So pi over 2 is about 1.5708 and you'll notice if I get really close but not exactly pi over 2, say 1.57, I get quite a large y value when I plug that into my calculator. Notice I am definitely in radian mode if you're using your calculator to check some of these things. The same thing if I plug in negative 1.5708, I get undefined, but if I plug in a number very close to that, I get kind of a, a small negative number, right? A big one, the negative 1,255.8. So that tells me my values on this side are decreasing, on the right side they're increasing as I get closer and closer to those undefined. And these undefined values are going to start representing where we have vertical asymptotes on our graph. And definitely when you're graphing the tangent function, it's important to be able to graph those asymptotes. So let's go ahead and maybe you want to pull up Desmos at this point. Let me go ahead and graph it. Here is our tangent function. And yes, right, it looks very funky. Um, we notice pi over 2 and negative pi over 2. Those are going to uh, be where my vertical asymptotes are. But notice I've got lots and lots and lots of vertical asymptotes. Every single time I add another pi, I'm going to get another vertical asymptote. So let's go over some things that we should note. So in order to figure out the period of a tangent function, I simply figure out what is the distance between my asymptotes. Distance between my asymptotes. So when we try to graph new things, we're going to figure out what that distance is. For my domain, meaning what can I plug in for x, I can plug in anything as long as it's not pi over 2 or any kind of multiple of that. If I add any pi's to it or subtract any pi's to it, that's where I wind up with those vertical asymptotes. So that's why I'm not allowed to plug those values in for x. My range, if I look kind of from the bottom of my y-axis all the way up, my range is negative infinity all the way up to positive infinity. I get all those y values. We've already talked about those vertical asymptotes, and the symmetry is, is around the origin. That's why it makes it an odd function, because that symmetry is right there around the origin. Um, some things to note. Uh, this one, we're going to sketch it very similarly to how we kind of did the last section. We're going to look at the very, the very front there. That A value is going to tell me whether or not it's reflected in the x-axis, right? If it winds up being negative, we're, we're going to have a reflection. A is also going to tell us whether or not it's been vertically stretched. My B value here that's going to tell me if it's been horizontally stretched. And when I say stretched, I also mean compressed, right? Whether 
some kind of dilation is happening either vertically or, or horizontally. And then the C value, that's going to tell you if you're translating left or right. And it's just like what you think, it's, it, right? It's the opposite of what you think, but it follows the exact pattern of how we've seen it work in the past. Okay. So let's go ahead and um, graph some of these. So how, how do we graph them? Okay, here's kind of the process that I recommend. Number one is we want to find the vertical asymptotes right away. So we take whatever is right after the word tangent and we set it equal to negative pi over 2 and positive pi over 2 and we're going to solve for x. Those are going to tell me my vertical asymptotes. The next thing we're going to do is we're going to say, okay, what is the midpoint between those two vertical asymptotes? That's where I'm going to have an x-intercept. Third, we're going to calculate the distance between those two just so that we know with certainty what is um, my period for that tangent function. There is no such thing as amplitude, so no amplitude, not something you have to work or worry about. I would never ask you about the amplitude of a tangent function. And after we've plotted kind of the x-intercept, let's, let's maybe plot another point or two just so we can make sure that it's facing the right way, so we're kind of getting the stretch to it. Uh, it, it really it really depends. And then your book recommends sketching a couple of different cycles. Now, I think on this first example, I, I want to make sure we have a lot of space to work with, so I may only draw just the one cycle. But if you have the space to do it, go ahead and you can graph more cycles. And by more cycles, I mean like if we plot our first one and we see the diagram of it, well, see if you can fit another one over here and another one over there. If it doesn't fit on the graph, not the end of the world. On your homework, you have four uh, sketches to draw. Just do your best, best on graphing those. So let's look at our first example here. We have y equals, and you may want to write it this way, 1 half x, whatever makes the most sense to you. So that tells me I'm going to have a horizontal stretch. I don't have anything going on out front. I have no reflection in the x-axis, anything like that. So really, we're starting with a nice small example to kind of get us, uh, get us started. The first thing we want to do is find our vertical asymptotes. So I take x over 2, or 1 half x, and I'm going to set that equal to negative pi over 2, that's going to be kind of my first formula, and then positive pi over 2. And I'm using negative pi over 2 and positive pi over 2 because that's where my original tangent function has vertical asymptotes. So I'm trying to figure out where are they located now. I'm going to solve for x, so I'm going to multiply this side by 2, multiply this side by 2. So I get one of my first vertical asymptotes is at x equals negative pi. I'm going to do the same thing over here, multiply both sides by 2, and my other vertical asymptote is at positive pi. So let's go ahead and graph this, and like I said, I kind of want to make sure we could fit it all. So we'll do negative pi, negative pi over 2, pi over 2, pi, and we're going to want to put in our vertical asymptotes here. Right. The next thing we want to figure out is what is my x-intercept? Well, my x-intercept is halfway between my vertical asymptotes. So what's halfway between my vertical asymptotes? My origin. So my x-intercept happens to be right there at the origin. Not too bad. The third thing that we want to calculate is what is the period? So the period is the distance between vertical asymptotes. And that is 2 pi, right? Because I've got to go pi and then another pi, so I add those together to get 2 pi. And then the last thing we want to do is maybe find another point or two. because I you, Because I know I don't have a reflection, I know it's kind of going to go like this, but... Let's, let's just plug it in. Let's plug in x equals negative pi over 2. So I'm going to look, use my original equation, and I do the tangent of negative pi over 2 divided by 2. That winds up being the tangent of negative pi over 4, which is negative 1. 
So at pi, negative pi over 2, I'm down here at negative 1. And then if I plug in x equals positive pi over 2, I get y equals the tangent of pi over 2 divided by 2, which is the tangent of pi over 4, and that is a positive one. All right, so go ahead. I'm going to connect the dots, and it's going to go all the way up, but never touch. And down here, it's going to go all the way down, but never down. And there we've graphed our first function, our tangent function. And I highly encourage you, right, jump over here to Desmos, and let's change this to x divided by 2. And we can see, yep, those asymptotes don't make any sense anymore. It's been vertically stretched, so I'm going to remove that divided by 2. And we can see, okay. Now I see with my period being 2, my next vertical asymptote is going to be all the way up at x equals 3 pi, right? So that's my next vertical asymptote, So I've got to go two more pi's to show one full cycle. That's what I mean. I wasn't sure if we were going to fit it on that chart there. But a great thing to do is to definitely check on Desmos. Let's go ahead and move on to example 2. Oh, that's in your notes there. So let's look at example 2. Now we're going to look we're going to mix things up. we got a lot going on with this one. The first thing I notice is we're going to be reflected in the x-axis, that negative out front. Next, we've got the 3. That tells me I'm going to have a vertical stretch. So maybe we kind of have these skinnier cycles. We might be able to fit more. And then this 2 here, we're going to have a horizontal shrink. It's kind of the opposite of what you think. Always afterwards. It always ends up being afterwards. So we're going to have a very, instead of maybe my function looking kind of like this or it's nice like that, maybe it's like really skinny and goes up. But let's see. Remember, we're doing our best graphing it by hand, but you definitely have Desmos that you can use. So let's, let's kind of identify the things that we need to. The first are our vertical asymptotes. So I'm going to set the what's ever after my tangent. I'm going to do 2x is equal to negative pi over 2, and 2x equals positive pi over 2. I'm going to solve that. I divide both sides by 2, so I get x equals negative pi over 4 and x equals positive pi over 4. So those are my two vertical asymptotes. That tells me that the period value, right, the distance between those two there is pi over 2. So we've definitely shrunk this down a bit. Let's go ahead and also our x-intercept we kind of want to get as much information as we can. Our x-intercept is going to be at 0, 0, because what's the point in between those two? 0, 0. So we'll do negative pi over 4, negative pi over 2, negative 3 pi, oh, sorry, 3 pi over 4, negative pi. So in this one, we're just going to go to negative pi and positive pi. Yeah, positive pi over positive pi over 2, 3 pi over 4, pi. All right, so let's go ahead and draw those vertical asymptotes. So since I know my period is another pi over 2, it's going to just repeat up to here. So at 3 pi over 4 and negative 3 pi over 4. So maybe on this one we'll draw a couple extra cycles. I know my x-intercept is going to be right there in the middle, and because it's reflected in the x-axis, it's not going to go this way. It's going to go this way. And notice I didn't find any additional points with this one. Figure it's just kind of do your best. It's stretched out. It does not have to be perfect, but I would like us to kind of get the gist of what it's going to look like. Shouldn't have that little bump there. All right. Let's go ahead and move on. So what does the cotangent function look like? Let's jump over to Desmos here and look at what cotangent looks like. Cotangent of x, oh, look at that. Looks very similar. It kind of looks like the tangent function reflected in the x-axis, but then also moved over. Because now my asymptotes, we've got one at 0, and we've got another one at pi. So the nice thing is, 
with our asymptotes being a little bit easier to get to at 0 and pi, when I set up those equations and solve for x to get my, my asymptotes, those are a little bit easier equations to solve. But it really looks very, very, very similar. The real difference, right, is think of cotangent. Cotangent is cosine divided by sine. So whenever sine is 0, cotangent will be undefined. So that's, that's just kind of the, the difference between the two, right? Tangent is sine over cosine, so we were worried about cosine being 0. Now we're going to be worried about when sine is 0. And that's what this says. But it, it repeats the period of it is still pi. Our domain is pi plus any more numbers afterwards. Our range is all real numbers. And our, our we talked about those vertical asymptotes. And then we also know it's an odd function. So let's go ahead and look at an example of 2 times the cotangent of x over 3. So I know it's got not going to be reflected because I don't have a negative out front there. The 2 tells me that we're going to be vertically stretching it. And the 1 third x tells me we're going to have kind of a horizontal stretch as well. But even if we don't realize it, just by figuring out kind of where our vertical asymptotes and all that good stuff is, we can, we can figure this out. So let's find our vertical asymptotes. Because we're talking about the cotangent function, we're going to take x over 3 and set it equal to 0, and then x over 3 and set it equal to pi. That's, how I, that's really one of the first ways on how it's different. So I get x equals 0 is one of my first vertical asymptotes. And on this one, I get x equals 3 pi is my second vertical asymptote. And obviously, there's many, many, many more. So let's go ahead and graph that so far. So we've got x equals 0. We don't have a point there. We've got a vertical asymptote. And then we're going to be up here. Here, let's see. I might only really be able to fit. 3 pi, so we've got pi and 2 pi. Now here's kind of a, an interesting thing here. Um, we've got to figure out where our x-intercept is. So where is the x-intercept? Well, it's halfway between. Halfway between. 0 and 3 pi. So that's going to be 1.5 pi, or may, I, I kind of like to think of it in fractions, 3 pi over 2. But either way, you're going to be right there in between. That's where your x-intercept is. Your period value is going to be 3 pi, right? It goes from 0 to 3 pi between our vertical asymptotes. So at least that's the same. Right, so 3 pi, 2 pi, and 0. So there's that. So we've got all that information. Now last time, I know uh, with our last example, we didn't figure out some other points, but maybe we want to. So now let's figure out, so this right here, right, is 3 pi over 2. So what's halfway between these values here? Well, it's 3 fourths of a pi. It's right here, 3 pi over 4. And then up here, halfway between these is going to be 9 pi over 4. So... Let's plug those x values in and see what we get. So if I plug in x equals 3 pi over 4, I know we're doing some fraction math here, 2 cotangent of 3 pi over 4 divided by 3. So I get y equals 2 cotangent of pi over 4. The cotangent of pi over 4 is 1, so 1 times 2 is 2. So that's kind of where that vertical stretch comes from. So up here at 3 pi over 4, we're up here at 2. Now let's plug in x equals 9 pi over 4. y equals 2 cotangent 9 pi over 4 divided by 3. So I get y equals 2 cotangent of 3 pi over 4. Now the cotangent of 3 pi over 4 is negative 1. So I get a negative 2. That's why down here, 
at negative 2. And of course, we kind of see the shape that we would expect here. And if we wanted to, right, we could repeat that same cycle down here. But that's kind of how you graph these. Whether it's cotangent or tangent, you follow similar pathways. It's really just making sure you set up those vertical asymptotes correctly. So how about some of these other functions? And by reciprocal functions, we're talking cosecant and secant. Now these are funky, right? We do have vertical asymptotes again. We have to worry about when sine is zero for cosecant, and we have to worry about when cosine is zero for secant. <sighs> yep. <laughs> so when does that happen? We're going to have a repeating uh, vertical asymptote every pi. So we're going to have vertical asymptotes wherever we've got kind of this n times pi. We'll, you, I'll, hopefully, let's see what it looks like. So let's go ahead and, and graph it on, on Desmos. Let's do, I don't know, let's do secant. It, it really doesn't matter. What in the blazes? What have we got going on there with secant? Look at secant. Now, in order to kind of understand where secant is coming from, let's look at cosine. Oh, notice the relationship. So your book recommends, I recommend, probably anybody that has looked at these before, is if you are going to graph secant, the first thing you should do is graph cosine. So that's exactly what it says. The graph of cosecant, first sketch sine, okay? That is how we want to do this. Some things to note. So in your book, you have, or in your notes, you have these nice pictures here. We talk about our, our period values, right, of how often it's going to be repeated. And the reason why our period is 2 pi, even though we have asymptotes every pi, is because the period of cosecant has to include both the upper parabola and the lower parabola. So that's why this whole thing here represents the period. And within the middle of your period, you have a vertical asymptote. And it works the same way over here. Your domain is all numbers except for every time you come across, right, that pi, every pi times that you're going to run into a vertical asymptote. And your range is restricted. We never get the values between negative, uh, less than negative one, or sorry, greater than negative one and less than positive one. So notice how they're using their union symbol here to denote that. So the secant function over here has very similar setup, the exact same thing except for that domain. Notice how my um, asymptotes are going to be at negative pi over 2, pi over 2, 3 pi over 2. They're on the pi over 2s. But you still can add any pi to that and get another vertical asymptote. My cosecant function is odd, just like sine is. And my secant function is even, just like cosine is. So how we doing? We are, we're ready to move on? <laughs> okay. So we talked about getting some hills and valleys, all of this kind of stuff that we want to set up. Let's look at an example. And of course, the example in our notes, not necessarily super easy because we've got this vertical stretch out front. We've also got this translation. The pi over 4 is going to be to the left. So we have a vertical stretch by 2. We have a horizontal translation left pi over 4. And so we got a lot going on even with just this basic function. The first thing we're going to graph is sine. The exact same thing, right? I'm going to take the exact same equation here, but I'm going to replace cosecant with the word sine. That is going to help us out here. So for our sine function, let's figure out our x-intercepts and all that kind of stuff. My amplitude is 2. So that tells me my range value for my sine. Remember, we're talking about sine now. It's going to be negative 2 to positive 2. Okay. My uh, period, 
since I don't have anything in front of the x that I have to worry about, remember that's your b value since that's a 1, I just do 2 pi divided by 1 which is 2 pi. So it's going to start repeating uh, after 2 pi. So let's figure out right where we're going to have some of these x-intercepts. So let's figure out those x-intercepts. So to remember how to graph our sine value, we're going to take what's in kind of the parentheses, which is our x plus pi over 4, and we set it equal to 0. We also set it equal to 2 pi. So over here we get x equals negative pi over 4. Over here we get x equals positive 7 pi over 4. So those are going to be my x-intercepts for my sine function. Remember, we're still just talking about sine. So let's go ahead. We got negative pi over 4, and up here we have 7 pi over 4. Let's figure out all the points in between. So we've got 0 up here. Maybe I can, maybe I might need to move that one. Pi over 4, pi over 2. Yep, I'm going to have to move that one. I'm going to give myself enough space. We got 3 pi over 4 pi, 5 pi over 4, 3 pi over 2, 7 pi over 4. Okay, there we go. So here are my x-intercepts right there. So that tells me my sine function is going to do its full cycle through there. Right in between and right here. It's going to be my full cycle, so let's go ahead and draw that. So halfway down between here, and here, maybe two, seven, eight. Oh, okay, sorry, not too long. All right, so there's my sine curve, and we know that it repeats and repeats and repeats and all that good stuff, but let's <laughs> let's just at least go with that. Okay, so now we have our sine curve plotted. What do I do? How do I plot cosecant? Well, what we want to do is we want to put a vertical asymptote right wherever you see an x-axis, an x-intercept, excuse me. Every time you see an x-intercept, hmm, I kind of made those a little bit different in size, you're going to go ahead and put that. Okay, so we've got our vertical asymptotes. Now, to draw cosecant, this is really all I'm expecting. You go ahead and put one parabola up here, one parabola down here. That is all I am looking for as you graph this cosecant function. Okay, that's really it. That's why it really comes down to being able to graph the sine or the cosine that matches it. Let's do another example. Oh, let's just do our books. Okay, let's look at our next one. The, the secant of 2x. So we want to graph y equals cosine of 2x. This one's a little bit easier, a little bit more straightforward. So we have an amplitude of 1, which means I'm going to have a range value of negative 1 to 1. My period value... I do have something in front of the x, so I have 2 pi divided by 2, which is pi, so that's going to be the period value. So let's go ahead and start graphing this. So we're going to do a whole cosine with pi. So let's go ahead, um, I might spread this one out a little bit, pi over 2, pi, pi over 4, 3 pi over 4. Um, Maybe we'll come down here. We'll do negative pi over 4, 3 pi over 2. Negative pi. Okay, so we're going to do a full cosine cycle. And we'll go up here to 1, down here to negative 1. So remember, cosine starts up here, right? So it's going to go down here. Alright, so there we've got our cosine function there. Our x-intercepts 
Now, now that we've got cosine graph, let's think about secant. Wherever I see an x-intercept, I'm going to go ahead and graph a vertical asymptote. That one I probably moved too close together. There we go. So now, as I draw secant, I simply go up and go down. And go down. So as many as you can kind of fit on there. Like I said, it does not have to be perfect. I'm not looking for perfection, but to know kind of where the parabolas are located, that is what we are trying to do right there. And when you're done, right, come on over here and double check that it looks right. It looks pretty good to me. Um, and that's, again, that's what I'm looking for there. All right, so to just wrap up this lecture with another <laughs> challenging thing is what's called a damped trigonometric graph. And I'm not asking you to really understand too much about it, um, but here's the thing. What if I multiply sine cosine by a, another value? So in this case, I'm multiplying it by x. It's going to adjust my graph quite significantly, okay? And what happens is you take whatever the value is out front and y equals x, which we know that we know that line, we know what it looks like, right? That's just a slope of one with goes through the origin, and then y equals whatever the negative of that, and so negative x. That has a slope of negative one goes through the origin. They then dampen our sine graph. And you can hopefully kind of see what they mean by that, that those become kind of the barriers from within the sine function has to operate. And it's kind of a weird thing, and really it's just introducing you to some of these vocabulary terms. So if you do end up taking calculus and above, you're, you're not kind of overwhelmed. You've at least heard of this before. It's something that when we multiply a sine or a cosine function, it's going to shrink that curve down. It's really going to what we call dampen it. So for example six, it says to graph this, and you think, oh, how am I going to graph this? So here's the, what I really want us to figure out. What is dampening? So what is dampening our function here? Well, I take whatever's being multiplied to the sine curve there. So I have y equals e to the negative x. That's one of the things. Now the other one is y equals negative e to the negative x. I keep everything kind of the same. I just tack on a negative out in front. And it may help a little bit if we actually kind of graph this in Desmos. All right, Desmos has been helping out a lot today. So let's go ahead and do uh, sine, uh, wait, let's make sure, let me put it in correctly, e to the negative x times sine x, like, ooh, that looks super funky, right? That looks really, 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 really funky. What is going on there? Looking funky. Let, now let's graph e to the negative x. Okay, that maybe kind of explains this here. And let's do negative e to the negative x. Well, that kind of explains it too. A lot going on there, right? I guess we can kind of see where that's coming from. So let's jump back and try to put this into our notes. Again, it does not have to be perfect. I'm not looking for anything perfect here, especially on this one. So let's, here's negative one, here's one. We know our E functions are gonna look like this. So there's our negative one and here's our positive one. And just so we can really kind of see it. Now remember sine is going to start at the origin and then go up. So if you just kind of like want to draw a sine like that, and then as this goes down, it's going to be even bigger. But it's, it's dampened by that function. <laughs> not, not a very perfect drawing, but again, uh, I'm really just trying to make sure we understand or have heard of this vocabulary word dampen. Uh, the nice thing is the last page of your notes on this section, whether or not you like it or not, uh, it does include a nice little summary for you of all of these, including the domain range and period. So it's just a good kind of reference or cheat sheet that you can have. So hopefully that wasn't too much. I know these first two sections of this, uh, this next part of our unit have been quite a bit. I think our, our next section, the 4.7, won't be as, as bad. Thanks for your time.